I think it's hard for any of us to be anything but what we are. And so I have long stopped trying to change myself and just embraced the fact that I'm all over the place and that I like lots of things. And in some ways, um, I think my work is different because of that. I'm going to list the, uh, the, uh, the titles of the books you have published. Okay. Uh, Circle, uh, Salvina Molesta, which uh -huh. is a type of plant. I didn't know <laughs> this. Then is The Boss, mm -hmm. uh, Barbie Chang, and Obit, which is the last one. And then you have two children's books, um, Love, Love, and Is Mommy. Mm -hmm. You're also the editor of the anthology, it's the Asian American Poetry, The Next Generation in 2014. I think. And there's a forthcoming book, uh, Dear Memory, and the subtitle is Letters on Writing, Silence and Grief. My father's frontal lobe died unpeacefully of a stroke on June 24th, 2009 at Scripps Memorial Hospital in San Diego, California. Born January 20th, 1940, the frontal lobe enjoyed a good life. The frontal lobe loved being the boss. It tried to talk again, but someone put a bag over it. When the frontal lobe died, it sucked in its lips like a window pulled shut. At the funeral for his words, my father wouldn't stop talking, and his love passed through me, fell onto the ground that wasn't there. I could hear someone stomping their feet. The body is as confusing as language. Was the frontal lobe having a tantrum or dancing? When I took my father's phone away, his words died in the plastic coffin. At the funeral for his words, we argued about my miscarriage. It's not really a baby, he said. I ran out of words, stomped out to shake the dead baby awake. I thought of the tech who put the wand down, quietly left the room when she couldn't find the heartbeat. I understood then that darkness is falling without an end that darkness is not the absorption of color, but the absorption of language. On the acknowledgments page of both uh, the book um, Barbie Chang and Obit, uh, in one of them you say that, uh, thanks to my family for tolerating my sometime intolerable obsession with reading and writing. Uh -huh. And then in Obit you say, thanks to my family for tolerating my obsession with poetry and poems. Ah. So how long have you been obsessed with poetry <laughs> and poems? Um, I would say more actively. I mean, I have an, I'm an obsessive person. So whatever it is that I'm doing is, is sort of the central thing that mm -hmm. my everything that I revolve around, that it's like I'm constantly spinning in a maelstrom of whatever it is I'm obsessing about. So if it's if it wasn't poems or in the past, like in the past, I, I didn't take poetry quite as seriously and didn't have as much time. I'd be obsessing about something else. So <laughs> I think it's just my personality is I get kind of fixated on things. And uh, and I don't know. So, and one day you wake up and you're no longer fixated on it. And then there's probably a time period where you may be fixated on little things, but then the next big thing comes and I'm fixated again. So I think it's a very difficult personality to be around, um, <laughs> to say the least. But I think that uh, I should, I constantly thank them because I know they endure a lot of my tics and personality traits that can be really annoying. Yeah. Your first book, uh, Circle, is from 2005, is that right? Mm -hmm. So before that, were you an avid reader of poetry? Do you have Not an as much. I mean, poetry has always been a part of my life, but I think that I wasn't ever sure that it was, I didn't really understand how one could do poetry and do life. Like, it, it just <laughs> seemed really hard to mix them together. And so um, I, I took class, I mean, I wrote in elementary school mm -hmm. and then in high school, thanks to all these English teachers. And in college, I took some classes, but I didn't really understand how to integrate it into my busy life. Um, you know, where I was supposed to get a job and be able to put, you know, feed myself and rent an apartment. Yeah. It just, I didn't understand like how you could do that. And um, so I just always did it kind of on the side. 
Mm. And what happened to change that when you say, "Oh, I, I'm this. I can this. I can, I can be serious about this." Or, yeah. Or, or well, I mean, I give permission to be obsessed about this. Sure. Yeah. No. I mean, they, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of other people just give themselves permission, and I I always had so much respect and uh, appreciation for people like that because I wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot of interests. So the other thing is, it's like I'm all over the place. I like I'm interested in everything, and uh, and I am anything could pique my curiosity. Um, and so I'm very unfocused. And I think, um, but when I get focused, I'm very obsessed. So it's kind of this weird dispersion, vertical uh -huh. sort of thing happening. But I I really distinctly remember um, receiving the Guggenheim Fellowship. And being really surprised to have received that in 2017. And that first, when I received it, I thought to myself, wow, maybe I should spend more time <laughs> reading and writing poems. And um, maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be so flippant about it and just sort of do it seriously on the side. It was a serious hobby, you know. I see. And then my mother had already passed away at that point. And I think that also helped me to focus on poetry more because I think she, you know, my mom was awesome. You know, we had great relationship, but I was always trying to seek her approval. And it was hard to know what she approved of because I think she didn't really approve of anything. She was just that kind of really critical mother that um, had a heart of gold. And so I think when she died, I felt a great sense of freedom to... Mm be a little bit more free-flowing and the Guggenheim Fellowship certainly encouraged me to change careers a little more. So I, I started adjuncting, looking for like teaching jobs and did a little bit of adjuncting to see if I liked teaching. Um, I read a lot more and then I think that was it. I just kept on going and now I feel like my whole life is poetry but <laughs> but it's not I mean I spend I still have like a full-time job and I'm working and doing all these things you have an uh, you have a, a master's in business administration I do <laughs> see I'm interested in everything <laughs> I just kind of go here I go there and I'm you know I, I'm, I am the canoe on the river and I just go <laughs> and I just you know there's no no oars and it's like there's nobody sitting on the canoe it just goes wherever it goes and so, uh, yeah, the Masters in Business Administration was just following some of the people that I happened to be around at the time um, who were looking for jobs in banking and finance and management consulting. And they're like, why don't you go do this? You seem like you'd be really good at it. And let's let me help you put together a resume. OK. <laughs> and I did. And I just you know got these jobs. I got into business. So I was like. You know, there just wasn't enough um, intentionality, in, in, and I'm and it's still today. I'm not very, I'm not as intentional as I as I probably should be. Even in my writing, it's not. People always think, oh, it's like you thought to write this book. No, no, it was completely bottoms up and and formed while I was writing, and so I think intentionality has always been um, not in my vocabulary. So um, yeah. In an interview with uh, with the LA Times, uh, you say exactly this. You say, think making art is so not intentional, mm -hmm. not conscious. I was just messing around and playing. So true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so true. And I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's hard for any of us to be anything but what we are. And so I have long stopped trying to change myself and just embraced the fact that I'm all over the place and that I like lots of things and in some ways um, I think my work is different because of that and and the things I think about or write about are just all over the place and it's okay it's fine yeah. well I think you can you can see that in the, in the poems the poems have very layers there's mm -hmm. an interest in science there is lyricism there's references to pop culture there's mm -hmm. humor so I think that kind of being all, all, over, all over the place, as you say, has benefits. Yeah. So if we focus on your uh, poetry books, even though there's a lot of elements in these poetry books, do you see a constant? Do you see a, a theme that appears all the time, like a thread? Yeah, I mean, I think if anything, the thread just might be a sense of play, um, a sense of exploration, uh -huh. a sense of querying and questioning. I think some of my early poems may have shut a little bit too tightly 
um, a little box that just snaps shut. But I was just exploring and playing around and was neither here nor there and doing a lot of sort of mimicking other people. And then it wasn't until maybe The Boss, um, my third book, where I mm -hmm. said, why do I need to sound like everyone else? Um, I think it's probably best if I just be the quirky me and <laughs> then just do my own sort of thing. Um, it's not to say that these books weren't influenced by other poets, because I think we all are, yeah. but I think it wasn't nearly as palpable as maybe some of my early books. And so I would definitely say a sense of play, um, very a restless kind of mind mm -hmm. and uh, very open-ended and exploring and questioning and querying and I like to look at things from a hundred different angles, and then I like to relook at it, and then relook at it. You know, at different times of day. It's like if you have a, you know, a gemstone that you're curious about. I mean, you could, you know, depending on what time of day you're looking at it, it, might look different. You might bring it to a different environment, and the texture might feel different. Yeah. It's more arid or more wet, and and that's sort of my personality. It's like I'm just going to beat the thing to death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, the the your uh, your latest book, Obit, um, has been very well received. So congratulations on all the awards: is Los Angeles Times Book Prize, Pen America. Um, also was the um, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you're. Um, your courage to to be who, to be who you are in these books have uh, has has been well well received. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'm most interested myself in reading work that really um, pushes the boundaries a, l a little bit and sometimes a lot. So I think that I've just stuck to my guns, you know, and tried to be who I am, even though it may not feel like it's matching what other people might be wanting or doing. And that comes with its costs, you know? I think that um, you may not be well-received, but we don't, I don't do this to be well-received. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly not for me to be well-received. It's if, if we want the work to be read, we want the work to be read. And so to me, there's a huge separation between myself and, and my work. And to me, I just want to, keep trying new things and pushing the boundaries of myself and writing in different ways and being really creative. And um, yeah, we have a hundred ideas in, in an hour and it's interesting to me what ends up sticking and what ends up to be a book. I wanna talk a little bit about the, the last two books, uh, Barbie Chang and Obit. Uh, both of them have um, like a brilliant uh, structure. I'm not talking about the poems, but the, the sequence of the poems. In uh, uh, Barbie Chang, you have the couplets, mm -hmm. where, uh, and then you have this, uh, in the middle of the book, you have 15 sonnets, mm -hmm. almost like a, like you go to a little garden and you do explore something else, and then you continue with the, with the poems in the shape of couplets. Mm -hmm. And then in Obit, um, the book uh, starts with uh, obituaries, mimicking obituaries in a newspaper, also in the format, like a, like a long rectangle. But then in between you have tanka poems. Mm -hmm. So this is um, like a very practical question. Do you have a method or do you have a, a, te a technique to design the, the arc of the book? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, I literally start writing one something uh -huh. and, then, and then if I feel like writing I just keep going and um, I only write in very compressed time periods and so I'm not writing every day. I, I think I should try doing spreading out my writing but yeah I wrote Obit, the obituary poems in two weeks and so that's 70, I counted 70-ish poems in two weeks. Didn't really do much else as you can imagine. Wow. It was in sort of this, I don't remember much of it but I do remember being very um, obsessive and, yeah. and it was I was constantly writing these and, and tired and um, all these other things and then and I didn't know what they were and um, but I just wrote them and and then later when they made their way onto the computer was when I started thinking what should they look like um, but they they served as the little obituary just the beginnings of obituaries mm -hmm. so and so died on this date at this time became a prompt for me to be able to even address or deal with the grief that I had been experiencing. And so it just got me writing is really, because I hadn't written, you know, typically I don't write for years, two, three, four years, mm -hmm. and then I feel like I don't know how to write, um, and I am not a writer. And and so uh, 
I didn't want to write after my mom died, and I didn't want to write elegies, but the obituary form just starting, it was easier for me to get me going just to kind of process some of the things I felt. Um, but yeah, it wasn't later, it was like much later. I, I, I put it on the computer and started messing around with what it would look like, and it's actually very precise. It's like this has two inches this way, 1.8, and one and a half spacing. It had to be a certain font, and I'm not usually that anal, but for these poems, it felt like they had to be They needed that to way. be like that, mm -hmm. and then you, you uh, incorporated the Tanka poems That's kind right. of to, to change the... Right, and the Tanka poems are written with a whole bunch of other formal poems, like sonnets and pantoums, and I was just practicing writing because it had been year like a long time and and I wondered can I can I write and so I thought it's just I've like I've never written a guzzle or a huzzle before and so maybe I'll write a huzzle and I've never written a pantoum before so I'll try that and they they didn't turn out very well but I, they got me writing again yeah, yeah. and then I had written some tankas and um, my friend had basically said these tankas should stay and in fact look do you see how these some of these themes are sort of talking to each mm -hmm. other, but they sh why are they all in the back? Take them and spread them out. And so I, I just threw all the other poems out and I kept the tankas and I just put them two on a page because they felt lonely. <laughs> <laughs> One on a page just felt like it was right in the middle and I yeah. centered them. It felt yeah. like it was right to do that. I think they, works, they, they work beautifully in the, the way the, the book flows. Mm -hmm. um, I would like you to read a poem from, uh, from Barbie, Barbie Chang. Okay. Um, it's called uh, Father Calls, I believe, and it's on page 34. Barbie Chang's father calls again, calls her again, again. He calls her, still knows how to dial a cell phone. Barbie Chang's father has another problem, always has a problem, doesn't know he is liminal. He says Barbie Chang's mother criticizes him, all is wrong today, today he calls his hands handles. Today his handles hurt. Today Barbie Chang's mother handles the bad news poorly. Today the doctor thinks three months but says six. No one can fix Barbie Chang's mother. Once her mother had good hearing, could hear anything, see and smell everything. Corners were always too sharp, too dark, no hearth, always harping on everyone. What was wrong with everyone? Too dumb, too short, too tall. Not enough college, collar too white, moon too fraction, moon too waxing. When she is not yelling at him or asking about the taxes, has Barbie Chang finished her taxes again, asking about the taxes, the same taxes, or whether she can fix his brain? She lies on her side, thin body shaped like a large ear. The, the poems in Barbie Chang are all of them, uh, except for the sonnets in the center, they are all uh, made of couplets, mm -hmm. and also Barbie Chan presents a very compressed um, cast of characters. It's, yeah. it's uh, Barbie Chan, the father, mother, uh, Mr. Darcy, uh -huh. the daughter, and the circle of mothers in the school. So it's a very, like a, like a tight cast. Yeah. Um, and um, it's one of the, you know, when we read a, mo a novel, sometimes people say, oh, you cannot put it down, or you cannot stop reading. This is a book that you cannot stop reading. I'm glad you read the poem because you can see the, or you can feel the velocity of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is the compression of the cast of characters, and there is the, the couplets that produce this speed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was um, something uh, conscious that you wanted to have this kind of a speed in the book. Yeah, it's funny. When I was reading it, I was like, I haven't read these poems in so long. And um, and I think that and they have no punctuation and they're in staggered couplets. And uh -huh. there's a lot of wordplay as I was reading it. It's been so long I can think about it from sort of a third party perspective. I think they, um, they're they very jagged, you know, thinking about the repetition is working against the line break, sometimes with the line breaks, sometimes with the stanza breaks. Um, and a lot of there's a lot of wordplay, hands and handles, and mm -hmm. I think I had a lot of fun writing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I now I'm looking at it like that was been fun. I think I think I, I I and this is very much so pulling from my experience writing the boss, which is my third book, which is very sonic and and uh, a lot of fun. And I think thinking back on it, both the boss and Barbie Chang, I think writing was was. Um, about getting out of the poem's way and getting out of my own way and not tr and trying really hard not to uh, determine where the poem would go. And I so see. I think I think wordplay and language play and repetition was a way to um, 
sort of circle around those obsessions, but also allow them to jump away from those obsessions, become other obsessions through language. So in many ways, language was a bridge to other language and other things. And mm -hmm. so the poems, I think, just sort of go all over the place. Um, but you can feel certain themes that are cir circulating again yeah. and again and again. Yeah. The, um, the book um, Ovid uh, was published in 2020. Uh, you talk about your, your mother's death uh, and also your father's uh, debilitating stroke. And um, of course, in order to talk about that, you have to reveal information about uh, I remember one poem you talk about how you, um, the head of your mother was covered mm -hmm. when, when she was in the hospital. So um, is it clear for you um, how much you want to share? Or mm -hmm. sometimes you, you hesitate. Is this too much? I'm sharing too much. I'm, yeah. I'm impacting a, th uh, you know, a third party, things like that. When, sure. When you write these very uh, kind of private poems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think that the like what I always think about and, and what I tell people, my, some of my students too, is that I, I'd hope that when we're writing, we don't think about those things as much. And so just let it come the way it wants to come. And then after, when you're revising is when you put on another kind of hat, which is <laughs> looking at it and saying, oh, I don't know if I want to put that in there. I don't know if that makes me seem a certain way mm -hmm. or, um, but I think during the drafting process, I, I was trying actually the op to do the opposite, which is to be as authentic as possible. And um, very much so wanted to see if I could explain to someone sitting across from me, like right now, how awful I felt. <laughs> mm -hmm. And is it even possible to use language to explain to you a yeah. person yeah. right now how bad I feel and what grief is and what and, and can I define it? There is something that um, happens in Obit, um, and I develop a certain fascination about it. I call it um, renaming, but mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a good term. You may have a better term for that. Uh, it's almost as if you force the reader to re um, to rethink something. For example, the ending of the poem, when you talk about oh, is the oh, is the death of language that you have to rethink, or you have to re you have to rename uh, the, what you take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think it's connected to uh, representation, like when we communicate through symbols, you know, through through words. But we are not communicating the thing, the, mm -hmm. the referent. For example, in in Obit, you say uh, the child cries out loud, makes a noise that is the expression of pain, but not the pain itself. Mm -hmm. Or um, a sketch of a person is not a person. There must be a way of drawing a picture so it doesn't become an elegy. Mm -hmm. And I found that um, it's almost like the impossibility of, of communicating because we, we use this uh, representation, but are we really um, communicating the, the, the content, mm -hmm. what we want to say? So I, I became very, um, very obsessed, uh, if, <laughs> if I can use the word, <laughs> with that. And I was, I was wondering if this is something that is related to grief or is just the, the impossibility of writing about anything? Yeah. Or the difficulty of writing about anything. I think it's both. I mean, I think that um, I, I I feel I feel like all language is 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 failure, and all <laughs> it is is trying and trying and failing, and and how close can can you get? And uh, when I finished this book, I actually felt like I hadn't quite succeeded because I and I revisit things over and over I define redefine re you know it's like mm -hmm. and it because I don't think it's possible I mean we know what we feel like um and and it somewhat resembles what other people feel but how are we to articulate those things when we talk about the the structure of obit um we you know there are the obituaries like imitating the obituary in a newspaper, but there is also the, the, tanka, the tanka poems. And I would like you to read um, one obituary, which is the obituary for a, ri a writer of obituaries, which is on page 66, and then a tanka poem okay. uh, on page 89, just to see the contrast between the two formats. Okay. The obituary writer can die before the subject. John Wilson died in 2002 before the publication of his obituary on band leader Artie Shaw, who died in 2004. What if I die before my father? I've written his obituary in my head every day since his stroke. 
My father's brain has died before him. It was surrounded by his beloved skull. What if the hinges on his skull break and the brain falls out? Do I give it back or toss it? What if we call the waiter over and God comes instead? Do we offer him a seat and a brandy, or do we cover our eyes and hope he doesn't see us? My mother spent years knowing she would die, but in her last days, she had no idea. To suffer for so long with knowledge, but not to finish what was known. Why do I need her to know in her last moments, like the people who died in the Oakland warehouse fire, crawling on the floor, trying to sort between a battered organ and a door between a staircase and a shadow. Death isn't the enemy. Knowledge of death is the enemy. I put on a shirt, put on a pair of work pants, because I will die. How the snow falls to its death. How snow is just dressed up rain. Where do they find hope? Sometimes the city has pleats. Sometimes the body rings with joy shaped like violets. Sometimes the night wind tingles. The end of the, the poem about the, the obituary for our, the writer of obituaries, the ending is, uh, let me find it here, is very, uh, it's a good example of um, this renaming death isn't the enemy, knowledge of death is the enemy. That, mm -hmm. That's what I call the renaming. Mm -hmm. So just to close the interview, do you have uh, one last poem? Oh, sure. I can just pick yes, yes. any poem. Choose anything you want. Um, this one's called Blame. Blame wants to die, but cannot. Its hair is untidy, but it's always here. My mother blamed my father. I blamed my father's dementia. My father blamed my mother's lack of exercise. My father is the story, not the storyteller. I eventually blamed my father because the story kept on trying to become the storyteller. Blaine has no face. I've walked on its staircase around and around, trying to slap its face, but only hitting my own cheeks. When some people suffer, they want to tell everyone about their suffering. When the brush hits a knot, the child cries out loud, makes a noise that is an expression of pain, but not the pain itself. I can't feel the child's pain, but some echo of her pain based on my imagination. Blame is just an echo of pain, a veil across the face of the one you blame. I blame God. I want to complain to the boss of God about God. What if the boss of God is rain, and the only way to speak to rain is to open your mouth to the sky and drown? Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure.